Let's look at uh, verse 9 of Romans 4. It starts off, cometh this blessedness. And that's where I got the title of the message, this blessedness. This blessedness is the blessing of Abraham. That's what it's called over in the book of Galatians, the blessing of Abraham. That's what the apostle is talking about in the context here, talking about how Abraham, who, who the Jews held in high esteem and who they even went so far as to use their physical connection with Abraham, their physical uh, descendancy from Abraham as a ground for their being made right with God. We be Abraham's seed. You know how many times you read that in the scriptures when, when the Lord was preaching the gospel or dealing with truth or when the apostles and you know, I think about passages like John chapter 8. You remember where Christ talked about how the truth will set you free and how the Pharisees, Jewish uh, unbelievers, how they uh, come back at him. They said, well, now, wait, wait a minute. We're, we weren't born in bondage. We, we're Abraham's seed. And, and, you know, really, you know, it's amazing how false religionists will lie to themselves. And that's what, you know, even we can do that if, you know, the Lord has to bring us to our senses, doesn't he? But they'll lie to themselves because, you know, they said we're, we were never in bondage to any man. Well, who was in control of Judea at that time? The Roman Empire. And they were, they were forced servants of Caesar in that sense. They had to work with Caesar. You remember in their uh, uh, attempts to discredit the Lord. And then in their final attempts to bring him to trial and crucify him, they had to work with Caesar, <laughs> had to work with the Romans. So they were in bondage, but they claimed that they weren't because they were Abraham's seed. And what they were saying there is that we're not sinners. We're right with God. We're righteous. And one of their points was we're Abraham's seed. And Christ said, well, I know that you're Abraham's seed physically. I know that you're ethnically a descendant of Abraham physically. But he said, you're not Abraham's seed spiritually. Because Abraham, listen, Abraham didn't do what you were doing. <laughs> you're trying to kill me. The Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior, God in human flesh. You're trying to accuse and kill me. He said, Abraham do, didn't do that. And later on in John 8, remember in verse, I think it's verse 56, he made this statement. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it, and he was glad. So they were Abraham's seed uh, physically, but not spiritually. Well, this blessedness is, is the same blessedness that he described, that David described back up in verse 6. Look at it. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now, that's the blessedness that it's talking about in verse 9. Come of this blessedness. So here's what we know. Now, you, you remember when we first started on, on chapter 4, I talked about how God made a lot of promises to Abraham. If you go back and read Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 and, and passages in between, God made a lot of promises to Abraham. Some of those promises were physical, earthly temporal, and they applied only to Abraham's physical descendants, like, for example, the giving of the land of Canaan, all right, and uh, that he was going to make them a nation and all of that. There's physical things there, but then there's also spiritual promises that, a that God made to Abraham, which do not apply to the physical descendants, but only to the spiritual descendants, both Jew and Gentile. And it's clear in this context that that's the kind of blessing that Paul's talking about here. He's talking about how God justifies a sinner. How God saves a sinner. And then the blessing here is described plainly. And I don't know how people can get away from it. I guess when they get to verse 9, they stop thinking about verse 6. But you know what people say. Well, he's talking about the, the bless, this blessedness that God's going to give that land back to, to the Jews. This, this blessedness is not to an earthly nation, and it's not concerning an earthly land. This is not about real estate here on earth. 
This blessedness is the blessing of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. And that's salvation. That's spiritual blessings. That's eternal life. And so he says, verse 9, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision, that's the physical Jews, the, the physical descendants of Abraham, does it come upon the circumcision? Is it for a Jew only, one who is born naturally to Abraham, or upon the uncircumcision also? It, can, can any Gentiles have any part in this blessedness? That's what he's saying. Or do they have to be converted? Do they have to be proselytized? You remember Christ talked about that in Matthew 23. He says you go about trying to make converts. <laughs> and what do you do when you get them? Make them twofold more the child of hell than you are. That's what he said to them. Why, what does that mean? It means they were teaching them a false way of salvation, a way of death. And so he says, does this blessedness, this, this blessing of righteousness imputed without works, does it come on the Jews only or on the Gentiles also? He says, for we say that faith was reckoned. The word reckoned means imputed to Abraham for righteousness. Now, what is that faith there? Well, that faith there is the promise that God made of righteousness imputed without works. What do we believe? You see, this is what people need to understand about the word faith. You cannot separate faith from truth. If you separate faith from truth, what do you have? You believe a lie. Isn't that right? Now, people all over this country, they can believe whatever they want to believe. But that doesn't make it true. Just like, there's no kids here this morning, and so I'll, I'll say this. I don't want to warp their world, but, you know, they, they believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> but so, sooner or later, you're going to say, see, no, that's not the case. Believe the moon's made of green cheese, you know, whatever. But believe in not. People who believe that salvation is conditioned on themselves believe a lie. Whatever condition it is, people who believe that it's their believing that makes the difference between saved and lost, they don't have faith in Christ. They have faith in their faith. They're believing a lie. The faith here is the body of doctrine, the teachings of the gospel, wherein righteousness imputed without works is revealed. And so what he's saying here, he says faith was reckoned. What God promised to Abraham was reckoned to him for righteousness. Now what did God promise Abraham? Well, Christ himself said it. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. And he was glad. So it's the promise that God gave to Abraham in the gospel to send Christ as the Redeemer, the Messiah, to die for Abraham's sin and bring in righteousness for Abraham as well as all of his chosen people, Jew and Gentile. Now look at verse 10. He says, how was it then reckoned? Well, what is he talking about? You know, we say, well, the word reckoned means imputed, means charged, it means accounted. So what does he mean? How was it then imputed? Now, there are a lot of people today who believe this. They believe, well, God imputes righteousness as a result of our believing. Well, that's not how it's reckoned, okay? That's, that's wrong. God doesn't do anything for us by way of salvation because of anything we do. You understand that? He doesn't give us or do anything for us or to us because of or as the result of anything we do. Everything we do that is honoring to God by way of blessing, by way of believing, repenting, is the result of what he has done for us. Grace, grace, grace. So how was it then reckoned? Now what Paul shows us here, and the translation is right, I believe. He shows us here exactly what he's talking about. Look at it, verse 10. How was it then reckoned? When, now he's talking about a when here. When Abraham was in circumcision or in uncircumcision. Was righteousness imputed to Abraham when he was, uh, after he was circumcised? 
physically or before when he was in uncircumcision. Now, that's, that, you remember what I said about the Jews, that, the unbelieving Jews. They, they, they basically, I've said this before, they, they basically had three points upon which they boasted of a right relationship with God. Their physical relationship to Abraham and then their circumcision. You see, we're not, that's why they were called the circumcision, okay? And then they said they, they claimed to have kept the law of Moses, but they didn't. So he says, well, let's, let's see them. All right? We, we've already settled the issue of what Abraham found according to the flesh. A physical connection with Abraham has nothing to do with righteousness, with salvation, with forgiveness, with a right relationship with God. He's already settled that. Now, what about circumcision? Does it have anything to do with it? Well, how was, it re- how was righteousness reckoned to Abraham? Was it before or after he was circumcised? Not in circumcision, verse 10, but in uncircumcision. Righteousness was reckoned to Abraham before he was circumcised. So in other words, circumcision didn't have anything to do with it. It meant nothing. Now you remember the apostle over in the book of Galatians chapter 6. You remember that? He he was talking about in verse 14. And he stated there what I always call the the believer's confession. (laughs) And you can find that. You can find, obviously, you can find a believer's confession all over the Bible. This is a great example of a true believer's confession. And it's in Galatians 6 and verse uh, 14 where he says, But God forbid that I should glory, that I should boast or have confidence, save or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what is the cross? That's his death. That's his blood. That's, that's the ground of salvation. That's his righteousness. And he says, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And look at verse 15 of Galatians 6. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. New creature, new creation. Circumcision had nothing to do with it. And it's clear back here in Romans chapter 4 and verse 10 that Abraham was justified in his day. Now, somebody said, well, how could he be justified if Christ had not already come and performed the work? Because it was by the sure and certain promise of God, and in God's mind, and it's God that justified, in God's mind it was a done deal. All the promises of God in Christ are yea, and in him amen. Abraham had a surety already. Now, the surety had to come in time and pay the debt. He had to redeem Abraham by the blood He had to pay the debt. He had to settle the issue. And he did. And Abraham knew that he would, just like David. Remember David on his deathbed? He said, although my house be not so with God, he hath made with me a covenant that's ordered in all things. And what? Sure. Now, why was it? Who ordered it? God did. Not David. And why was it sure? Because it wasn't conditioned on David. Had it been conditioned on David, it would have failed. If it were conditioned on any of us, it would fail. Isn't that right? Conditioned on David's substitute, David's surety, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's clear. Well, look at verse 11 and 12 now. He says, Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith. You notice that? That that article's correct in the... The faith. What, is, what was Abraham's faith? The gospel. Salvation by God's grace, based on the blood of Christ. The faith which he had yet been uncircumcised. You see, he believed God's promise before he was circumcised. That's a gift of God. And, them that, and all uh, and, uh, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. And that righteousness. Now here's another clear testimony of what's imputed it's not faith our believing that righteousness might be imputed unto them also that righteous how how do i know that righteousness that christ righteousness has been imputed to me how do i know that because that's an act of god see that's god's court of justice how do i know that i can claim that i'm righteous in christ well that's what he's talking about we believe We've been brought to faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
to believe in Christ, to trust him, to know that our salvation was conditioned on him and that he fulfilled all those conditions. That's how we know. But he tells us here that this, that outward physical circumcision was a sign. It means it was a mark, a token. And he says it was a seal. That's like a stamp or a signet or a, a label. To show this, that Abraham had already been justified by God's grace through the merits of the promised Redeemer. And what he's showing here is that, that physical circumcision was a type, a picture of spiritual circumcision. Now, if you turn back the page to uh, Romans 2 and verse 28, Paul had already spoken of this now. And you've got to keep Scripture in its context. See, that, that's the problem with people today in reading the Bible. You read Romans chapter 2. Then you jump to Romans chapter 3. And it's like they forget Romans chapter 2. But don't forget it. And here's what he said. Look at it. Verse, and you, you remember what led up to this in Romans 2? He's talking about the judgment of God's law. And here's what he says. Basically, it doesn't matter whether you're physically circumcised or not. Either you keep the law or you don't. And if you don't keep the law, then the law condemns you. Now, if you keep the law, which nobody does, <laughs> none righteous, no, no. If you keep the law, you're fine whether you're circumcised or not. And then he sh starts showing them. Now, circumcision was given to Abraham not for any reason that the Jews imagined, that like, well, that makes you righteous. That makes you right with God. No, no, no. It was given as a mark, a token, a seal of something greater. And here's what it is, verse 28 of Romans 2. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter that is not physical according to the law, whose praise is not of men but of God. You see what it's talking about. We'll go back to Romans 4. So Abraham received it. Look at verse 12. And it says, And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, that is the Gentiles, but who also walk in the steps of the faith. In other words, we believe the same thing Abraham believed concerning salvation. We believe the same uh, ground of salvation that Abraham, all right? And he's the, uh, the, that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. Now, you could go all over, you know, I, I think about Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. You remember what that says? Paul writes, for we are the circumcision. And he's talking about spiritual circumcision because he's talking there in the church of Philippi to both Believing Jews and believing Gentiles. And he says the way we know that we've been circumcised in heart and ears, as Stephen said, all right, we are the circumcision. We worship God in spirit. All right, we worship God in the spirit. In other words, what that means, I believe it's two things. It means we worship God not as we think him to be, but we worship God as he reveals himself to be in his word. And we worship him from the circumcised heart, sincerely, in truth and in spirit. So we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. Some translations say by the spirit. Either way, it's true. And he says, and we rejoice in Christ Jesus. That word rejoice there in Philippians 3.3 3 is the same word glory in Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should glory. It's the same word glory in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 uh, where he talks about at the end of that chapter, let he that glorieth glory in the Lord. It means have confidence. We have confidence in Christ. Our assurance, our boast is Christ. What he did, his righteousness, his blood and have no confidence in the flesh. That's what he's talking about. So it's a type. So this proved that Abraham is the father of all them that believe, both Jew and Gentile. 
Now, when he says Abraham is the father of all them that believe, he's not saying that Abraham is our father in the same way that only God can be called our heavenly father. When we pray, we say our father. That title is never to be given to any human being. Did you know that? I, I hear these, these guys uh, you know, referring to Catholic priests. Well, Father, that is wrong. Only God is our Father. But why does he call Abraham our Father? Only in this sense that Abraham, God has determined to use Abraham as the prime example. And the word is archetype. You ever heard that word, the archetype? All right, I think I put that in your lesson. He's the prime example of how God justifies the ungodly. He's the prime example of what it is God commands us to believe and receive in the gospel. And right here's the content of it. Righteousness imputed without works. Just like David said it. Abraham the same way. And that's, that's how Abraham is called the spiritual father. And you can read about that. I, I've, got this in your, I've got this written out in your lesson here. Look uh, on the back of the... Uh, let, well, let's read verse 13 and I'll go to that. It says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world... Now, heir of the world, that's referring, I believe, to the new heavens and the new earth. We inherit a new heavens and a new earth. I don't think, he's certainly not talking about this sinful, cursed world. Who'd want to be heir to that? We, we will receive a glorious blessing of eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. Peter spoke of it, you know. This world's going to burn up. You know, that's why I talk to you about environmentalists, you know, all the time, you know, how I always think about this, you know, people talk about climate change. Well, I believe in climate change. I do. This world is never going to stay the same. I believe man is the culprit. And I'll tell you how far back to take it. Adam fell and brought the whole world under the curse. And doesn't Romans chapter 8 tell us the whole creation groaneth until the revelation of the complete nation of the children of God? So, and this world's going to burn up. Now, having said that, I'll tell you, I think we ought to be responsible. And I think we ought to be good stewards. I don't, want to, I don't want me or my children or my grandchildren drinking dirty water or breathing dirty air. I don't. So we ought to be responsible and accountable and do what we could. But we're not going to save this world. And I'll tell you another thing. Man cannot destroy this world. I don't care what they say. I don't care how many atom bombs they build. Man can, that, only God created it. Only God destroyed it. He's going to destroy it. But the world that Abraham inherit and all, of, all who believe, sinners saved by grace, that's what Abraham was, were heirs of the world. Going to inherit the earth, but not this old sin-cursed earth. The new heavens and the new earth. All right, so he says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. In other words, this salvation, this blessedness, this glory of the new heavens and the new earth, it is not in our possession because of our works of the law. It's in our, but he says it's through the righteousness of faith. It's in our possession through righteousness which Christ accomplished according to faith, according to God's promise, you see. And so uh, look at uh, uh, what well, he says in, in verse 14. This will be our last verse today. Yeah. He says, for if they which are of the law be heirs, if those who are trying to be saved by their law works, if they're the heirs, if they inherit this blessedness, this world, he says, well, faith, what God promised, is made void. And the promise made of none effect. It's kind of like what Paul said in Galatians 2 and verse 21. He said, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ died in vain. He didn't have to come and die. But look in the back of your lesson. We'll close with this. Look at Galatians 3.26. Listen to this. It says in verse 26, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The evidence that you're a child of God is you believe in Christ. 
rest in him. Verse 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You believe in Christ. Verse 20, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Equally. And if you be, be Christ, that's a possessive. If you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. That's what Paul's saying there. He just sums it up in those verses there. Okay.